lying, but okay. <laughs> no, no, he, he's incapable of lying. <laughs> Hi there. Hello, how are we doing? All right, how are you? Are we all together? Is this everybody? This might be, I guess we, uh, I'll give it a little while and see if we have uh, more join us. I'm Hal Boyd, by the way, of the Deseret News. It's nice, nice to meet you. Both you. Good to meet you. Is there a way to see um, you know, who's in the audience or? There's, there's one person in the audience, I think. Ah, okay. Aaron Sherinian. Great. Oh, I, think I know Aaron. Oh, hi, He's Aaron. a good one to have in the audience. Oh, wonderful. Well, let's go ahead and let's just jump into it then. Uh, I know there were a, a few of the panelists who were traveling, but um, uh, welcome. This is an exciting discussion. I'm glad that you can take the time. This is obviously a topic uh, that is on everyone's mind right now with regard to kind of coming out, or I think some communities feel as though they're coming out a little bit of, uh, of COVID and what it's going to look like in the future. Um, and uh, I think having a, a robust discussion of how we're going to shape uh, uh, the world, communities, make governmental decisions, healthcare decisions in the next year uh, is going to be a, a, a pressing concern for a lot of organizations, including yours truly and certainly from a press perspective, it's an issue of, of great concern to the public. So with that said, uh, why don't we just tee up uh, the, the discussion by kind of digging into what do you think the next four months, four to six months are going to look like from governmental decisions as we were already seeing transitions certainly in the United States with regard to certain policies, but, but give us a global perspective. What do the next four to six months look like as we approach uh, new policies and maybe a, a new way of looking at the pandemic? Nita, do you wanna, do you wanna begin? Yeah, I can uh, can certainly go ahead. Um, you know, I think that the if there if we've learned one thing from COVID is that trying to predict what will happen four to six months out is uh, you know it, it's very challenging, and that's because um, you know not only are, are the conditions constantly changing, the inputs are changing, but also uh, people's reactions to what's going on can really affect the dynamics of what's happening. So. You know, I think what we're seeing right now is a lot of uh, fatigue. It's full-blown fatigue of this pandemic. And, you know, I know that a lot of groups are, governments are trying to make the decisions to, you know, take off masks and stop mandates and just, you know, kind of return to a business as usual type of approach. Um, but I think what we've, we've seen in the past, we've, we've had this type of thing happen and then suddenly there's another tick up. And I think with uh, you know, there's constantly going to be new variants that emerge. Uh, we we now know that there's um, viruses are circulating in, in various animal populations, and, and we don't yet know what that could do for, you know, how these variants are emerging. And, and also at the same time, you know, now people are, you know, kind of becoming, um, uh, you know, more exposed based on some of these other choices. <clears throat> so I think, you know, what, what we're going to see is probably this kind of, um, more of an acceptance that this is this is going to be an endemic risk, and we'll we'll have to um, get more accustomed and kind of make those uh, trade offs related to uh, like the the level of risk tolerance that that people personally have and, and things like that. So maybe maybe I'll just stop there and, and you know see if uh, that's great, Scott. Yeah. Anything to add there on what do you think? Four to six months, too unpredictable. Sure. I have a lot to add and a little to add all at the same time, I think. So, um, yeah, just a little bit about me. I work, you know, one of my jobs is at the Eurasia Group. We're a political risk consulting firm. I sort of, I wear, I am the public health person amid the sea of political scientists. Um, and so a lot of my work is working with country analysts um, to understand the implications of COVID. Uh, and we do a lot, a fair amount of forward looking analysis, which obviously includes our best. Uh, uh, attempt at prediction. Um, that said, you know, I spend a lot of time talking about, you know, what I'm not, and I'm not a virologist and I'm not an immunologist. You know, I have a background in epidemiology and I've, you know, I've mostly been focused on pandemic preparedness and global governance for much of my career. But 
from the virology side and the immunology side, there's still a lot of open questions. And I, you know, certainly don't feel equipped or expert to really predict where that's going to go. And I think even the experts would probably say the same thing. Um, but there are a lot of things that we can start to kind of suggest is the direction this is going or think about based on sort of some of these, you know, still, still very large open questions um, around, you know, the, the virus and the variants um, and sort of what the, what the new surprises will be. Um, so I think, you know, um, as Nita mentioned, you know, I think there is an incredible amount of pandemic fatigue, which is certainly expected and understandable, you know, going into year three. Uh, the one exception there is China, which I can talk about, you know, in a little bit of a different, uh, from a different perspective. But so globally, I think the, the appetite for disruptive restrictions has been low for, you know, probably at least six months. It continues to get lower. That will almost certainly stay the same. I think that that's not necessarily by itself. Um, sorry, I, I, I just realized I didn't have my microphone on. Can you hear me okay? No, you're, you're just fine. You're coming okay, through. So just, I, I, I clipped it on. So is that better? Okay. okay. Anyway. A little bit clearer, but you're, you're, you were fine before. Okay, so, um, you know, I think that what you're going to see, and, and this is pretty straightforward, is a strong preference for the least disruptive interventions. And there's, there's some basic ones there, uh, you know, testing, uh, treatment, um, and, you know, things like ventilation, uh, improving ventilation. All of these things, if, you're, if you have the resources and you're interested in making those investments, you can make them, and the political costs of making them will be low. Um, and that would be the best way to sort of transition to this less disruptive new normal um, without necessarily incurring a lot of the, the challenges that we saw, the economic implications or even the political blowback. I think, you know, the political costs of more lockdowns or disruptions are now greater than the costs of more outbreaks. Uh, a lot of politicians who are making that kind of calculation uh, many of these communities are, are going to be more unhappy with these leaders if they go back into lockdown than if there was another uh, surge. Now, that's not entirely true across the board. I think many places still use as a sort of a basic metric uh, is healthcare strain, hospital strain. Uh, and if you do see spikes where the hospitals are overwhelmed, there are some places that are sort of willing to go back into that sort of more disruptive uh, area of policy interventions, you know, uh, you know, limiting indoor congregation, working from home, remote education, banning large, you know, large congregations and large public gatherings. You could see that. I still think, for the most part, appetite is pretty low. Uh, I would say Southeast and Northeast Asia remain probably the areas with the highest willingness to go there. There, there are still a handful of countries in those regions that do have relatively disruptive restrictions in place. Um, and I think, you know, that's really, that's, that's what we're looking at, you know, absent the, you know, any type of real huge surprise in one direction or the other. Um, you know, and then the next question, I think, I think if, so we're in March now, and you're asking me for four to six months, that conveniently takes us right to the sort of the Northern Hemisphere's winter, which I think is another real sort of flashpoint in terms of really understanding whether this does turn into a more endemic sort of seasonal pattern that we can be a little bit more, that we can predict a little bit better uh, or not. And I think it's still a big open question. Uh, another big question is this, the use of this word endemic. You know, what does that mean? What exactly does endemic mean? Again, we don't really know. And there are a lot of different scenarios within the basic category of endemic. And it's quite possible that let's say in the fall winter of the northern hemisphere we see another spike uh we see more hospital strain maybe we see an outbreak that is uh somewhat similar to let's say you know seasonal flu uh or we see something that's three or four times worse than that um if we are seeing like if we're seeing another spike that is significantly worse than seasonal flu and we're dealing with seasonal flu that's going to be a real healthcare challenge. It's going to be a real political challenge. And there will be a real sort of reckoning around how do we manage that um, during this phase. And, you know, vaccines are important. I think, though, that it's possible that they, are, they may not uh, ever be as helpful as they were in sort of the, 
March or the beginning of, in the middle of 2021, where they were very, you know, they were excellent at preventing severe disease and they're excellent at preventing infection and transmission. Now I would say they are very good to excellent at preventing severe disease and not very good at preventing infection and transmission. So you, you have more uh, transmission and then you have what I think is possibly the biggest sort of tool in the toolkit, which are these new treatments. Um, and if those treatments can be deployed effectively, some countries will do better than others. You need, you know, very effective testing regime. Uh, I think there will be a big investment in that. We saw that from the Biden administration. Uh, they announced a test to treat. That is a sort of a, you know, that is going to be a huge priority for many countries. It's still, there's still some uncertainty around what that, you know, how, how beneficial it is. But I do think that'll be a big piece of the puzzle. Uh, and that will help us sort of understand what the broader sort of epidemiological landscape is and the sort of uh, the messaging and the communications. Because again, yeah, I think that from a media and from a narrative perspective, it's really a big question. And then finally, I know I've been talking for a long time, but finally, I do think uh, the situation in Ukraine is very relevant here because we do have this new kind of uh, crisis that takes a lot of oxygen out of the room, takes a lot of attention away from COVID, and that's the reality. That's the sort of the media reality that we could be living in even into sort of 2023. And that changes things also. So watching how that affects our willingness to have these tough conversations and politicians' willingness to have these tough conversations will also be important. Excellent. Nita, just to, to follow up, vaccines. Do you see vaccines being central to the way that uh, COVID is fought going forward? Um, and in what way, what is the difference between sort of individual choice with regard to vaccines or, or governmental uh, 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 assistance there in terms of um, continuing to distribute them or encourage them? And then also secondarily, what, what, are, what are the other mechanisms, if not vaccines, uh, as, uh, as Scott was mentioning? Yeah, great, great set of questions. Um, so on the vaccines, I, I, I agree um, with, with what um, Scott has said that um, the vaccines really had a tremendous and maximal impact when they first arrived onto the scene. It was uh, a very um, important and welcome tool to help reduce um, both illnesses and the healthcare um, impacts for hospitalizations and deaths. Um, I think the you know boosters now that we're at this point uh, with boosters have also been helpful. Um, now you know what what will happen in the future. I think again is there's it's a little bit murky, but we could see a situation as what we have with seasonal flu, for example, where the flu viruses change significantly enough that there would be a new vaccine that's administered every year. That that's one possibility, or you know, it could be that you know that this is not what happens. So I think um, there's still a lot of unknowns there um, on the, on the vaccination side of things. Um, one thing I will mention that I think was um, you know really um, important aspect of the response to COVID was um, the ability to roll out the vaccine um, to lower income countries through the different um, mechanisms that were put place by Gavi and the CEPI and the, the coalitions that, that were built around that. The, um, you know, just the mechanisms of doing that really was the, uh, one of the largest um, vaccine delivery um, efforts within such a short time frame. And so, you know, I, I, I think the, the hope is that those types of mechanisms will persist into the future and can then be brought to bear for other types of diseases. Um, so, you know, perhaps um, that infrastructure will be beneficial going forward. Um, you know, other other mechanisms uh, where we might have um, control measures, uh, you know, I think uh, therapeutics, again, coming onto the scene uh, could play an important role. I think what's likely to be a, a, of the biggest impact of the future is, is going to be in those groups that are um, at higher risk, um, you know, more immunocompromised, um, older individuals and populations where even the immunity that's been built up from potentially already getting the vaccine or being um, sick with the virus, uh, you know, if, if that type of immunity can't re be re retained within, you know, a person, then I think 
those are going to be the people that might be at the highest risk. But then it's unclear whether additional vaccinations would be important to them. And then, you know, then the ability for treatments or even, you know, relying on some of the, the previous uh, efforts of even wearing masks or isolating or, you know, other other measures that we can always, you know, fall back to. But I think the the element that's that's likely to, to figure in is that I think doing these on a on a massive and broad scale is something that there, I think there's there's less appetite for. Uh, I think as Scott already mentioned. What as as we move into this maybe new phase where we're looking more at therapeutics, uh, the vaccine vaccines may take on a different role. Um, as you mentioned, more targeted toward those who are immunocompromised or particular vulnerable groups. Do governments shift to to focus on assisting those groups uh, more? Do, do you think we'll see that? Do you think we'll see specific programs deployed at groups who are maybe immunocompromised or otherwise at risk, age age demographics, et cetera? Go ahead, Scott. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that to a certain extent, we, we already seen that. Um, and that really is the sort of the, the sticking point for this transition to a sort of a, a new normal that um, I think is somewhat politically divisive. I think there are, you know, the, so one of the challenges with any sort of countrywide epidemic response or, you know, or sort of any kind of overall pandemic response is that it really is a kind of a, a taking of the temperature of the, of, the, of the interests and the values of that country or that community. And in some cases, that th those positions are relatively aligned. I think a good example is Denmark. Um, you know that's been in the news a lot. Uh, they ha they had a lot of success early on. The communications was very consistent. You do you look at the polling in Denmark, and there's a real coherence or a consistent uh, position on what needs to be done. And so when you know, I think it was uh, sort of early, mid-February, Denmark said COVID is no longer really a societally critical illness. We need to transition and think about um, sort of really focusing on the immunocompromised and thinking about how to um, make it the least disruptive as possible. The support for that was very high. Um, now I look at the U.S. and we don't have that kind of coherence. We also don't have the same levels of vaccination we don't, we have the politi politicization of COVID, which has made it very difficult to have this kind of community-wide conversation around what the trade-offs are and what the thresholds are. Um, and so in those places, you have, let's say that you have a transition that's going on now. You have a CDC that's putting out new guidelines that, you know, to be, to be blunt, nobody really likes in that some people think it could, should be um, more aggressive or more cautious. And other people think, you know, other people think the CDC has been too cautious all along. And we're still in this very divided environment where next steps is really challenging. You know, you have, um, it, you know, just the, the, the issue of masks by themselves, which, which, which are in fact relatively undisruptive are so um, divisive. And so, you know, you, when you talk about ways in which we can protect uh, immunocompromised, maybe very young children who haven't been vaccinated, um, you know, masks, you know, high quality masks are part of that. And yet, even there, there's so little agreement, you know, between states, within states in the U.S. It's a real challenge. So I think that, um, you know, these are the types of things that, you know, if you are at risk, you might be sort of uh they're more, there's more access to more tailored uh, interventions towards you. Perhaps you'll have more treatment quicker. Uh, perhaps there, you know, there will be some uh, accommodations in your work. Uh, but ultimately, if there's not really an agreement on that, if there's not consistency and agreement, I think you're still in for a very bumpy road in terms of this transition period. And then other countries, I think, particularly in Asia, where they have set up incredibly good digital infrastructure around contact tracing and there is more of that sort of community cohesion around policy um, i think there you you, you might see a, a much less divisive you know or bumpy transition to living with the virus thanks scott nita 
Um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, so far, uh, agree with, with everything that Scott has said. Um, you know, I think the, the, the critical piece, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, for access, I think also uh, depends on um, some of the disparities that we've seen, even um, at, you know as COVID has progressed. Um, so I think you know there, there are a lot of areas where um, you know the, there there could be increased access, you know, for immunocompromised as well as for um, you know health access in general. So um, I think there's there's a lot of work to do there, um, you know, and, and I think at least, uh, you know, at least it's been flagged as a problem. And now that that's something that governments are taking a closer look at to um, to improve for, for that, for, for COVID, as well as for, for future types of um, epidemics and pandemics that could occur. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, curious whether you think this is going to be, uh, really is going to be an endemic. I mean, we brought the question up at the beginning. What does that word even mean? You know, how do we define it, et cetera? Uh, what is the likelihood that we just we, we go through another wave of this in, in 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 four months? Is there any consensus? I mean, obviously a lot of variables there, and there's there's no way to predict exactly. But is there a sense that the kind of um, uh, the, the the kind of uh, evolution of this virus, um, the variants that may occur, could uh, swing us back into sort of a state of affairs that we were in this past fall, or I guess leading into winter? Sure. Yes. I mean, I can take a stab at that. I think the, the starting point is important and it's a challenge because of the definitional inconsistency around the word endemic. I think if you asked experts in the field whether flu is endemic, you would get a really wide range of answers. There's no agreement around whether flu qualifies as endemic or uh, sort of a, a predictable epidemic, like sort of a, it, and so um, the same thing applies to COVID. I think that, uh, you know, the, so the, the, the simplest way to define endemic for me is that it takes on somewhat predictable patterns. Um, and in the case of flu, that predictable pattern means you have a spike every, you know, at a somewhat predictable time, but that, in that in fact causes an epidemic. And so even there, there's a lot of, there's, there's a little squishiness around the two terms. And so with COVID, it's sort of the same thing. Are we going to see spikes? I think you know, that would be, you know, that's something that resembles flu. Um, and that would be, you know, something that we can really prepare for um, and sort of uh, adjust our healthcare system and our response and our testing infrastructure. Um, and that would be a transition that I think would ultimately be, I'd say at this point, desirable. You know, at some point, maybe it gets to common cold status. But I think at this point, we're just hoping for it to become a little more predictable and a little less uh, straining on the healthcare system, similar to flu, uh, which I think, you know, is it some sort of a, 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 either is endemic or is a predictable epidemic every year. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, there, this virus continues to surprise us. It's quite possible. I think, it, you know, if you, there's this theory that the, the Russian flu of 1890 was in fact a coronavirus, the pandemic. We don't really know if that's true or not. Uh, even even if it was, the reality is that we've never really in modern times been through a coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and so we don't know what the waves will look like. We don't know uh, what the variants will do. We don't know sort of the, the long-term immunity picture from getting repeatedly infected or repeatedly vaccinated. Uh, we have, you know, best guesses, but all of those things are still very big questions that I think we have to just kind of be humble about and accept that we're still uh, it's in a little bit of a wait and see mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would kind of um, also agree on that. The endemic definition is one that um, I think it means different things to different people. Um, and I think for, for coronaviruses, what seems to be, in my mind, the best case scenario is if it starts to resemble something more like our kind of seasonal run of the mill coronaviruses that we, you know, that cause, um, you know, uh, percentage of, uh, of um, colds every year. And so it could turn out that we, you know, we kind of have this virus circulating, but it kind of gets into the background of what, what's happening. Um, I think another um, outcome that, um, as, as Scott mentioned, that would be, um, you know, 
relatively um, more manageable would be if, if it happens in these kind of predictable uh, seasonal cycles or kind of mirrors what we would see with, um, with you know, with other seasonal viruses like, um, like influenza or even RSV or, or things like that. So at least then there's some predictability to it. I think right now that the, the challenging part is what's driving these waves seems to be a combination of um, you know, the, the way that the variants are emerging, a, along with the way people's reactions, uh, what sort of um, mitigation measures are in place, I think is, is kind of driving this dynamic that we're seeing with these, um, you know, what seem to be more frequent spice, spikes every um, several months or so. So I think, you know, what, what, um, what, what, what will happen, we don't know, but we can, uh, you know, kind of come to some analogies based on what we've seen happen with, with some of these other um, previous types of diseases. Okay, is there any, uh, we've got a, We've actually got a question that came in. I'll ask that question, then I've got a, I've got a number of others, but how do you see that, this is from Lindsay, who asks, how do you see the testing regime here in the US versus the rest of the world? The federal state disparities here in the states seem to have made our effort much more difficult despite our access to state-of-the-art technology and pharma. Nita, do you want to try that? How do you uh, see yeah. the regime here in the United States? For um, well, I mean, I think um, the, the U.S. Um, the public health system, healthcare system is, is extremely fragmented, and I don't think that has really um, done us any favors when it has come to any of the aspects of coordinating um, different um, parts of the response. Um, so, uh, so yes, I would say that the testing again, uh, you know, here, uh, it, it's, it's testing, it's also the, the reporting, the data, there's different standards, even by state, um, you know, there, there's, there's no really consistent way that this is being done. I think another aspect of it is a lot of people are now doing home testing and it's, 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 it's very likely that many of those uh, positive results aren't even getting reported back up into the, the system. Um, and so, you know, I think it's very challenging to to look at um, those types of numbers about infections when there's this sort of um, differences in how the, the numbers are coming in. Um, I think it, it is likely that um, hospitalizations and deaths are, are going to provide a more stable um, view into what's happening and what the current state of things is. And then compared to other countries, uh, you know, I think the, you know, every, I think every country can point to things that have gone well and things that haven't gone well for the for the for the response activities, and you know some countries have done a very good job of having a kind of like a national system, uh, reporting consistently, and uh, you know having a good track of the numbers as well as uh, good systems for contact tracing and just you know trying to stave off the the um, you know further spread. Um, so yeah, I, you know it. it it, it is a, a situation where it, it does seem that the U.S. doesn't perform as well compared to some other countries out there. But I don't know, Scott, if you have sure. anything to add. Yeah, so I, I completely agree with everything you say, particularly around the fragmentation. I also think, uh, Lindsay Singleton, you answered your question in your question, and it is really, um, it is really a disappointment how we've done, particularly because the U.S., if you were looking at the expectations before that, not counting the fragmentation because that was a huge issue and a well-known issue. Um, but we do have state-of-the-art technology and pharmaceutical industry and laboratory capacity, and we still failed. We failed from the beginning. We were too slow. There were errors. There was a political issue around uh, motivation to invest in testing. Um, we failed recently with rapid testing, with deploying them. You know, there was a there's an effort to send out 500 million and that would have been very, very helpful uh, in the early stages of the Omicron uh, out spike. But we didn't get those rapid tests until Omicron had peaked in most places. Now, you know, they're saying that most, you know, more than half of the rapid tests that they were ready to send out to people's homes still haven't been used uh, because of the because the, the, the demand wasn't there and it was too little too late. You know, and then finally, you know, moving forward again, if you're going to rely on these therapeutics, Testing is critical. Uh, there needs to be uh, a process place for people who get tested and then get treatments quickly. And if this at the state level or it, because of lack of health care or because of different reasons or different understanding around what's available, 
people aren't get, getting tested quickly, the treatments which need to be delivered very early won't be effective. And again, you'll, so that will undermine this incredibly potentially important tool. One thing that we've done really well, and one thing that uh, that we know was not effective or won't be effective in the future that we can kind of leave in the past. I know that's hard to keep it to just one. But one thing that we've actually done pretty well on, I'd be curious that we can, you know, that we can learn from sort of maybe implement or maybe it's not applicable in an endemic situation. But one thing we've done well, one thing that, you know, hasn't gone well that we can sort of leave in the past. What, what do you think, Nita? Well, it's a, it's a really um, broad question and hard to just, um, you know, pick one. Um, I think, you know, one thing that, that we have looked at um, recently um, that um, some, some of the information came out in the um, UN Secretary General report last, um, last year was related to um, the impacts of having better international cooperation and I know that um, you know we have a lot of um, you know a lot of a lot of room to make improvements there. But in fact, we compared what would have happened if we had had systems that were closer to what happened, what was in place in the year 2000, compared to what we have now, and found out that that actually um, made a significant improvement to the uh, amount of um, infections and deaths that occurred. So if if we hadn't had the types of progress we'd had over the past you know, 20 years or so since since the early 2000, then, um, you know, we would have even been worse off than we were. Of course, that's not to say we can't make, you know, that we wouldn't need, um, you know, more improvements there, more cooperation would be even better. But um, so I, I feel like that that actually went better in this situation than, than it could have and has done in the past um, types of events. Um, you know, uh, as far as um, things that, you know, I mean, for me, I think that the biggest issue really, and it, it's, it's not just about um, COVID, it's about um, epidemics and pandemics in general, is just that we do not really have the systems in place on a global scale to identify and find out when these events are first starting and to try to get them into that system and track them before they become these huge global calamities. And so we're um, at where I work at Metabiota. Explain, we're that, explain that a bit more. Drill, well, drill down I, for us what you mean by that. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think what, what we what we often see is that something may be circulating locally for some amount of time, perhaps, you know, even months. And only after that certain amount of time, it starts to come to the attention of, uh, of you know, health authorities or even into, you know, to, to the global community. And so I think what we often see there is this is, a, is what what I, I've been calling a first mile problem, which is that you know at that point when something, for example, many of these types of pandemics and epidemics emerge from animals into humans, and so that those first cases that occur are often not even detected, don't make it, you know, nobody knows that they're happening in the in the broader system. And I think what um, what what we need is, is a way to really get to those very initial cases and kind of stop these things in their tracks before they become much larger and much less manageable. Because um, the earlier we can intervene in an epidemic or pandemic, the, the more effective and, and less costly the response will be. Okay, Scott, any thoughts on the one thing we did well, one thing to leave behind, but and, and any responses uh, that you might have to what need us? Talk sure. Uh, yeah. So I think in terms of what we did well, I'm going to get a, you know a little bit on my high horse here, but um, I think the 60 plus years of public sector investment in basic research that ultimately got us the mRNA vaccines um, was is really a sort of an important part of this narrative. I know that you know the mRNA get, vaccines get a lot of attention. I know that you know it, there's you know there's a lot of different actors were responsible for bringing that um, to the table as quickly as they did. But, you know, the National Institutes of Health, you know, has by far sort of the most um, ambitious um, basic research program in terms of investment. Um, and, you know, a lot of it doesn't turn out, a lot of it fails, and that's sort of expected. Um, you know, but a lot of this work that went into the mRNA vaccine in 2020 
was the result of incredible amounts of investments from the NIH uh, to our university systems um, that ultimately you know, created the foundation for the mRNA vaccine, which could quite, you know, I think it's quite likely it will be transformational, not just for COVID vaccines, for the vaccine industry, for therapeutics. Um, and that's a pretty big deal, you know, presuming, you know, presuming there is another one at some point, the ability to create these vaccines quickly and scale them up, um, presuming that it is with an mRNA vaccine or some type of similar platform, that's a really big success. And I think, you know, we should celebrate that. Um, and I think we should also celebrate the decades of investment that went into it um, so that we were ready uh, and it was different than, let's say, 2003, which I think also was another sort of motivating force, uh, sort of the wake up call that SARS-1 was, was a, you know, did play a large role in, you know, in the development of the vaccines and also for many countries, you know, understanding what a, a good response looks like. In terms of things we could do better, um, I, I agree with Nita on the um, question around sort of distribution of, I think it was vaccines that you're referring to um, and, the, um, and the way in which we were able to scale up and distribute vaccines globally. I think, it, you know, from where I'm sitting, we've been, I've been looking at this, pro this prospect of an incredible supply shortage of much needed vaccines during a pandemic for a long time and a lot of what happened was expected. And then you have this in, in intervention from COVAX and the uh, WHO and CEPI uh, and Gavi. Um, and it was, I think, both uh, disappointing and an incredible success at the same time. Uh, you know, a disappointing because it could have been better, um, but an incredible success in that it was better than a lot of people had predicted. It was better at getting these vaccines into um, sort of low resource, low income countries, you know, faster than we saw in 2009, uh, faster than sort of some of the, the veterans of the pandemic preparedness world would have predicted because, you know, there were predictions before this pandemic of, um, of countries expropriating manufacturing plants to make sure that no vaccine left their borders before everyone in their country was vaccinated. You know, that, and that almost happened. It happened to a certain extent in some places, but it didn't completely happen. Um, and we do have now more vaccines um, available. I do think though, that for the next time, we will need more vaccines coming from more places. We'll need more, um, a, sort of a better system for addressing this incredible demand for both vaccines and treatments in emergency environments. And that includes thinking about um, our intellectual property globally um, and really having that in place before we get to where we are now, because you know we're two plus years into this. There's been this battle over intellectual property and about sharing and equitable distribution. And it's really gone too slow at this point. You know, the, there is no, there, there will not be a resolution to this challenge around equitable distribution until likely, you know, every, you know, the, the pandemic in certain, to a certain extent is over. And I think that really is a what is a challenge that needs to be addressed in the future. Okay, real quick, we're coming uh, up to our hour here. Let me let me ask you this: What is the messaging for both of you? What is the messaging that we need going forward in the United States globally? What is the appropriate messaging with regard to the the state, the current state of affairs uh, related to COVID nineteen? What's the proper message? Well, I can I can go first. I mean, I I think um, from my standpoint that the messaging should be not you know not to take our eyes off the ball here. That COVID is not the certainly not going to be the last uh, type of pandemic that will that will hit us. And in fact, the, the probability of this happening in the next twenty years is over fifty percent. So I think we what we don't want to happen is to lose sight of of that and. You know what we often see when it comes to these types of public health um, emergencies is a cycle of panic and neglect. So you have, you know, when, when the event is occurring, what people, you know, it's all hands on deck, but there's a huge panic, and then it kind of falls away. And I think the pandemic fatigue is not really playing, um, doing any favors for that because people kind of just want to get past it. And I think the the the, the challenge with that is that we know that we did not do as well as we could with COVID and that there are areas where we need to do better. 
um, especially to be ready for future types of events like this. And um, there, there is a, a danger that uh, people will just lose sight of this. It will fall away into the memory and funding will lapse. And, you know, I think that right now that is the, the big challenge that we don't want to lose sight of the importance of, of this type of risk going forward. Yes, again, I totally agree. The cycle of panic and neglect, I think, is really a huge challenge that we've seen before and that we still might see again. This was a huge calamity, and I still think it's possible that people really want to move on. The promises for investment don't really materialize once sort of the once the the global attention sort of shifts to other issues. Um, and then, you know, the the other part is that you know communications is a critical component of pandemic response. And I think there, you know, there wasn't a, a, enough of a recognition of that. Uh, it's very difficult. You know, we live in a very challenging information ecosystem. Um, the ability to do, you know, to communicate complicated science um, in simple ways or in ways that people understand and, you know, make, allows them to make the best behavior is extremely difficult. I think we're always going to struggle uh, I think we struggled more than maybe I would have predicted or maybe we could have. Um, you know, I think the, that part of that is the result of basic investments in basic public health literacy. You know, there needs to be an understanding of some of the basics of, you know, germ theory, of basic epidemiology, of uncertainty, of, you know, the, the, the reality of, of changing uh, situation on the ground, changing situation on the ground, you know, how do you communicate that is really a big challenge. Now we have this, I think what's sometimes referred to as the noble lie approach where you don't give all of the information because you think that if people had all of the information, they would do the wrong things with that information. They would behave improperly. You know, the best example, most po famous example is with sort of masks in the beginning of the pandemic. Dr. Fauci was saying, you know, we need to uh, don't worry about masks. That gets sort of oversimplified into him kind of underplaying the value of masks because he was concerned about availability in hospitals, which was true. But what ultimately that turns into is uh, the, the, the sowing the seeds of a very contentious mask debate that still hasn't really, um, you know, ebbed. Uh, and I think that's a big challenge. I think that the, the standard sort of crisis communication advice is you need to strike a balance between um, panic and complacency. Um, and, you know, we didn't really do that well. We didn't, we didn't message uncertainty as well in the U.S. Um, and, and let people know that information might change and that, in fact, isn't, isn't wrong. That is, that's expected. Uh, it's a really hard one. I think part of, a lot of that happens before a pandemic with, you know, public health literacy with understanding of how vaccines work and, you know, how we should assess their efficacy. If we could do that, that would be great because there's still a lot of confusion on that. Uh, and all of those things, yeah, they need to, it needs to happen in the inter-pandemic phase because once you're in the emergency phase, yeah, it becomes much, much harder. Well, our, our hour is up. Uh, very appreciative of you both coming on and taking it to inform us. Uh, I've certainly been in, in, enlightened by the discussion, and uh, I think it's a good note to end on in terms of some sort of balance between panic and complacency. I think that applies to just about everything. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Scott, Nita, it's been a pleasure. Thanks Thank so you. much. All right. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye, All everybody. Right. Bye.